Hello and welcome to the Potential Psychology Podcast. I'm your host, Ellen Jackson, and it's my mission to share the science of human behaviour in a practical, fun and inspiring way. In each podcast episode, I interview an expert from the fields of psychology, well-being, leadership, parenting or high performance. I pick their brain to uncover what they know about living well, what tips do they have for you and I, and I quiz them about how they apply their expertise in their own life. Join me as we discover simple, science-backed ways to live, learn, flourish, and fulfil your potential. Welcome back to Season 3 of the Potential Psychology Podcast. I'm really excited to be back. I have some great guests that I'm looking forward to sharing with you. Do I share guests? Sharing my interviews with my guests with you. And I'm going to try something else that's a little new for this season. It's a bit of experimentation. I talk to my clients about the importance of testing and learning. And so I'm going to test my little experiment and hopefully learn from you as to whether or not I'm getting it right. So at the beginning of each episode for this season, I'm going to tell you a little bit about something that I've learned. And this was a practice that I instituted several years ago writing my blog when I first started writing my blog. And I used to write a piece called What I Learned This Week. And I've stopped doing that. But I I think it's a lovely opportunity now, perhaps on the podcast, to reinstitute it and to examine something that I've learned because I love the concept of a growth mindset and the idea that as human beings, we always have the opportunity to grow and learn and develop. And I'm hoping that perhaps by me sharing this with you, you might like to think about what you've learned each week. And maybe there's something that I've learned that is helpful to you and help you to thrive and flourish also. So for my first, what I've learned this week, I am going to tell you a bit about what I did yesterday. So I had to drive to Halls Gap, which is a beautiful place. It's about an hour and 40 minutes from where I live in Ballarat. And I was off to speak to a group of community health care workers about change in the workplace and how to remain resilient and positive mental health and all of those things. And on my way there and on my way back, and I was delayed on the way back, the trip was about 45 minutes longer than it should have been due to some trouble on the freeway, I listened to a podcast. I listen to a couple of podcasts. I have favourite podcasts too. And um, they've inspired me to create this podcast. And one of those is the the psychology podcast with Scott Barry Kaufman. And he was talking to scientist and science journalist Carl Zimmer about the nature of hereditary. And they got talking about gene editing um, and the technologies that will allow us or do allow us, or perhaps not us as everyday people, but certainly the scientists, um, to take little splices out of our DNA and replace it with other DNA that perhaps is going to reduce chances of illness or um, it it does all sorts of magical things that I'm not fully equipped or able to explain. It was a fascinating interview and and it really got into some of the discussions about perhaps the uh, philosophical issues around this. So I I learned a bit about gene editing that I knew nothing about before. And the second thing I learned was listening to the Osher Ginsberg podcast and he was being interviewed on his own podcast um, in recent episodes by Todd Sampson, who you may know if you're in Australia and you've seen programs like The Ruin Transfer. He's a, a very intelligent and fascinating man. And Osher was talking about his experience of complex mental illness. And if you listen to his podcast, you'll know a bit about this or indeed read his book, um, which has just been launched. And Todd asked him about his experience of suicidal ideation and what was going on in his mind. Um, He tried to really get him to explain what it felt like, what was going on in his head in those moments at which suicide felt like an option. And I have had the privilege through my work in workplaces around preventative mental health and understanding things like suicide and and how we help someone who might be uh, experiencing suicidal ideation in the workplace. And I've had the privilege of having a couple of people who have explained 
to me and to their colleagues and sometimes to their boss exactly what had happened to them, their, their experience of mental illness, uh, the moments, the, the days, the weeks, the months, in some cases the years of suicidal thought, um, in some cases have actually explained their suicide attempts to me. And I have come to truly believe that there's a huge amount of power in sharing these stories. And I know that that has been what has driven Osha or prompted Osha to talk about his experience of complex mental illness and his experience of suicidal thought. And he said that it was other people sharing their story that has really helped him. And I know from my experience of listening to people's stories firsthand that they do. There's a, there's a huge amount of power in reducing the stigma and in increasing understanding. And when we understand, then we're better able, I think, to help and we're certainly more compassionate. So if you want to learn more, and I know this is a pretty deep topic to get into in my first little chat about what I've learned, I'm not quite sure that I even intended to go down this path, but it, it was something that really struck me as, as a beautiful explanation and very insightful explanation of where somebody's mind might be at this point. So if you would like to learn more, I absolutely encourage you to listen to those episodes of the Osha Ginsberg podcast. Um, incredibly insightful. So that's my nattering for this week. It's what I've learned and what I'd like to share with you. And now it's time to talk to our guest. With me today is Caroline Anderson from Performance Edge Psychology. And Caroline is one of those people who seems to have hit the talent jackpot. She not only runs two successful psychology practices and delivers training programs and workshops to athletes, sporting organizations and corporate clients on high performance and well-being, but she's also a former Olympic athlete herself. She's here to talk to us about the role of the mind and well-being in peak performance. Welcome, Caroline. Well, Ellen, um, thank you for that very lovely and flattering um, introduction. It's really lovely to be here. I listen to your podcast, so I'm very, um, very thankful to be invited along. Thanks for oh, having me. Not a problem at all. I'm, I'm going to be, well, you know I'm going to pick your brain with a whole lot of different questions about not only um, your work as a psychologist, the types of people that you work with and the services that you provide to organizations and individuals. But I'm going to start by asking you a little bit about your own athletic career because we're talking about peak performance and there really is no greater peak, I don't suppose, in the athletic realm than the Olympics themselves. Um, yeah, look, I, I, uh, I never had any aspirations of being an athlete when I was young. It, it's something that happened by surprise, um, happily, I was always quite a sporty child, but um, as I said, I was never a particular sport that I was good at. I kind of just liked a bit of everything. Um, but then I found Taekwondo when I was about 15 or 16, so quite late into the sport, and I guess it's just something that I absolutely fell in love with. I was very passionate from this from when I first started. And again, even when I first started, it was just fun. It was a hobby. I never thought that I'd even get to national level or you know, yet alone international or Olympic level. So I think it just grew out of the love of it. And as I got older and as I trained more, um, it just kind of happened quite naturally and quite quickly. I made the Sydney Olympic team as a B reserve athlete, I guess. And although it was very close, um, I almost was selected, but um, wasn't finally selected on for the final team that competed at Sydney. But I guess it got to show me that really elite level and um, being at Sydney as a training partner was just such an exciting and wonderful experience um, that I just knew I was hooked and that I would be working um, as hard as I could to try to make um, Athens, which um, I did. And it was a long, uh, you know, at times difficult journey, but um you know, obviously I, I feel very grateful that I that I was finally selected for that team and it was a very interesting experience. So people often ask, oh, it's amazing you went to the Olympics. Um, the first question they ask is, did I win a medal? And the answer <laughs> is no, uh, unfortunately. Um, and the other question I get asked is, oh, was it, it was a lot of fun. And the answer is no, it wasn't particularly fun. In fact, it was, it was very, um, 
demanding. It was very difficult at times. Um, obviously, everyone going to an Olympics, you know, is in different sports, but and there's going to be different pressures and different um, expectations and different team dynamics. For me, um, look, it, it was just a very challenging time, and learned and I learned a lot about um, that that really elite level sport, um, what being an Olympic village is like, the kinds of pressures that that I face and that athletes face, um, and it certainly can be very challenging, yeah. Yeah, I suppose that, I mean, it's probably a perspective that not many of us have really considered before that watching the Olympics, you know, it, it is made out to look like a whole lot of fun. I mean, I, I know we all kind of understand that there's a lot of hard work that goes behind that and, and often there's heartbreak and, and you see a full range of emotions, but, you know, we're comfortably sitting on the lounge at home watching and probably don't have a, well, I'm sure we don't have a full insight into perhaps mm. that full range of emotions or, or what it must be like. I mean, it, it must be quite a surreal experience turning up at the Olympic Village. Surreal, but but just uh, real and an intensity like nothing else, you know, one can experience. So, you know, in sports we can go to world championships, but, but nothing compares to the Olympics, you know, in terms of the pressure, even the politics, even even the financial issues that come along with that um, in terms of funding implications for not winning a medal and, uh, you know, it is just a very intensive environment um, that can either, you know, I think some some sports or some people can get that really right and sometimes it's not always going to go right and, you know, I certainly know what it, yeah, I guess I could I could definitely feel that um, that it was quite a difficult um, time and and I said you know I'm quite open about that. Like I think it's good to have that conversation because the a lot of people do talk about and and it is a really positive experience, but it's also you know very demanding. Yeah, and I, I can only assume now that you've sort of articulated that for me, I, I've got a bit more insight that this has set you up very well in terms of helping other people now. And that's part of what you do professionally as a psychologist is help other people deal with the full array of both emotions and and challenges that come with peak performance for athletes. But you also work with peak performers in a whole range of different areas. So what was it that drew you to psychology in the first place? Look, I, I always knew I was going to be a psychologist. Um, that that definitely preceded any Olympic, you know, uh, athletic ambitions that I had. So I, it was just something that I always had an interest to: human behaviour, human psychology, what motivates us, what drives us, even mental health. I just, or you know, I just remember as an adolescent reading books on those kinds of topics, and just always had quite an interest. So um, it was always I always kind of knew that I was going to pursue that. Um, I guess. Um, I, I was studying the whole time I was competing as an athlete, so I guess I was developing my skills in, in psychology as I was going along my athletic journey. Um, uh, but I always definitely felt the two were very, very separate. So I always kind of felt like I had my career and work and I had my athletic life. And I, I, for some reason, I never joined the two. They were two completely different parts of me and I guess when you're studying full time or working full time as a full, and also a full time athlete, there are challenges that that come along with that. Um, my sport was obviously a low funded, low profile sort sport, so to speak. So, you know, I kind of had to work or had to had to study. And I remember at times feeling, you know, perhaps a bit of a jealous for those um, athletes that could afford not to work or study. But in mm. the end, I think even at the time, but certainly. In reflection, um, I can see that it was something that really helped me, that I had um, my time away from sport at work or, or at, at uni um, where I was just fully immersed and got a real break and uh, time away from my sport. But likewise, when I'd finished a hard day of work, working in quite an intensive um, psychology environment, I got to let off that steam and go to sport and, and sort of so the two kind of complemented each other really well, I think, in the end. And I think it was something that helped me retain a good sense of perspective, I guess. Yeah. So that so it gave you a sense of balance. I'm wondering too whether while you were actually in that experience, and, and I know it was kind of early in your career as a psychologist, but do you think there were 
things that you're able to draw from psychology and from what you were learning about these things like motivation and mental health and well-being that you could use mm. or that gave you perhaps an insight that perhaps other athletes didn't have at the time? I, I question this a lot. You know, many, so this is, you know, 12, 13 years down the track. I don't think so. I really saw them as separate because um, I was training and working in mental health it surprises me that I didn't utilize the psychological aspect of, you know, and preparation in sport. I mean, you know, I was was with VIS and I had a sports psychologist. I just, you know, and I thought I'll try this and see what's going to help. I I, I don't know. I don't know if it wasn't, perhaps it wasn't quite what was working thing, but I don't think I put enough emphasis on the psychological aspect. The thing is with athletes, we get really trapped into the mindset of training harder. You know, it seems it comes all down to the physical aspects of I, I just need to get, you know, fitter, train, work, work harder, have more strength and conditioning. And and sporting organizations can get into that too. It becomes all about the technique or tactics or strength and conditioning. Um, and that's even back then I always felt like I had to put my emphasis and time because there is only so much time in a day mm. and I, oh, well, I chose that that angle and looking back now I realize there's much more I could have done there's much more I could have drawn for or read more or you know and I guess that, that that's part of what what I am passionate about and working with my athletes that the mental side is just so important but I just don't think I understood and maybe I wasn't mature enough I just didn't I um, probably didn't understand it enough back then yeah, and do you think it? Do you think as a profession it's changed over time? I'm, I'm going to ask you shortly a bit about, you know, how athletes are using psychology now. But do you think that's actually changed over time? I mean, I certainly get a sense working in workplaces that we're starting to get, as a profession or maybe as a community, a more of a kind of well-rounded view of where some things like psychology and mental health fit in across the spectrum. You know, we are talking about mental health in workplaces, for example, that just wasn't done 10 years ago when I, well, I started out 20 years ago, but even 10 years ago, it wasn't talked about. You know, are these concepts still relatively new? I know sports psychology has been around for a long time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I can, I think like anything like psychology itself, there's always changes. There's always new research. I think my, so this is just from a personal perspective of having had um, some sports psychology, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Um, I, I just feel like it was a bit basic, like there was basic strategies around visualisation, relaxation, um, positive self-talk. I, it just was stuff that it just didn't kind of hit the mark for me. And I think, mm. yes, over the last 10, 15 years, there's been a lot of, there's so much more dynamic and interesting and, and, and new ways of, of working with athletes that are constantly evolving and changing. And I think that stuff it really can help and really makes a difference. I think in terms of from an organizer's, you know, sporting organizational perspective, whether there's more uptake, uh, it's not still where I would like it to be. Some sports mm. have no, like I see athletes that have competed at multiple um, Olympic Games and have never seen a sports psych, have never had any or, or any psychology intervention. And I, I think, but why? You know, we're, we're 15 <laughs> years down the track, you know, like surely we understand more about the brain and about, you know, the impact of, of our mental game on, on sport. So, look, I, there is change. There is more embracing it. But I still think that we have a long way to go to fully um, see, you know, our mental pr- preparation in sport just as we see physical preparation. Yeah, and maybe, maybe that reflects you know, across the board, the, the spectrum maybe of our community that we're still kind of delineating physical health and mental health um, as two mm. separate things. And and often when we talk about mental health, we're really talking about mental illness, not about health in a positive sense, um, yes, which is something absolutely. that I talk a bit about in workplaces. So it, it's kind of still a burgeoning field with lots of opportunity. Caroline, One of the things that I I took a look at your website and you have a fascinating video on your website in which you interview or talk to a number of Olympians about well-being and what well-being means to them. And I'll put a link to that in the show notes because um, I think it'll be well worth our audience having a, a look at that as well. What struck me about that was that a lot of the people who were talking were perhaps past or, or athletes who had 
participated in the Olympics in the past. Um, and they seem to have a good sense of the importance of well-being and the, you know, reflecting on the fact that their mental health was just as important. And this goes a little to the question I asked you before that, you know, do you think they felt that at the time? Do you think this is something that they've discovered upon reflection? And do you think it's consistent across all athletes? That's interesting. Look, in terms of the the people I interviewed, I chose them for a reason in that I knew that they would be embracing these concepts mm. and, you know, they were very self-reflective and, and you know, they, they certainly could see that link. Um, in terms of in the whole, I think it's still a new conversation. I think it's still, um, which I, you know, again, it seems so logical and obvious that you're not going to get good performance without well-being, but it's, it's a, seriously, it's still a new conversation. I think, you know, language and the way in which sporting organisations are talking about wellbeing is, as has definitely changed. We see it in AFL. I work a lot with cricket. We're definitely seeing that begin to happen. I still, again, I still think we have some way to go. Essentially, you know, at, at any, the core of any, any performance is us as a person, as an individual. And if, if we're not, well within ourselves, whether that's psychological, physical, mental, um, you know, we're just not going to, it's going to impact on performance and it has to be the start of the conversation, you know. So um, I, I like to draw, when I work with athletes, I draw like a bit of a, a diagram and it's like, circ- like I guess layers on top of layers um, and the, the outer layer of, of that circle is, is performance. The, the, at the core of it is us. It's our well-being. It's our health. Yeah, and and if if that's not at the, if that core isn't strong, then all the other layers are going to sort of be impacted. Yeah, interesting. I think that um, it's kind of that onion. What's the word I'm looking for? Analogy um, yes. of having that core of being a human being, um, yeah. and then being able to kind of add all of those layers on. And and if that outer layer is performance, I think I think we probably have a sense of what performance looks like amongst athletes. What does performance mean more generally because you work with with athletes but also people in organizations and entrepreneurial type settings what what do we really mean by performance that's a really interesting question I guess um it's high when I think of high performance I think of high stakes high pressure you know and it's about being able to um achieve what we're trying to achieve in amongst High pressure, high perform, you know, high high stakes environments. So, when I think about that, whether it's with athletes or whether it's with with other individuals, I kind of see a number of, of again layers. Um, so, being able to manage and regulate our our emotions in in the face of high demand or you know high stakes fear, you know, failure, potential failure, potential loss. Um, you know, we have to be able to manage that that threat response, that limbic system um, that is so strong for us with, you know, humans. And a lot of the time we, we just don't, we lack that basic understanding of what's happening at a brain level, um, you know. So managing that limbic system response, that threat response um, in those those high-stakes environments I think is, is kind of the key. And then if, if we're able to regulate those, those sort of emotional responses a bit, better well what else are we doing so you know high performance is really about um focus and attention can we focus and can we use our attention um and and have appropriate decision making and and thinking processes when we need it most so when the pressure's on when there's high stress when the stakes are high so you know i think those two areas are really interesting areas when we think about high performance so managing our minds, managing our emotions, managing our attention so that we can do what we need to do in the moment that it's required, yes. whether that's giving a presentation or, uh, you know, speaking to the board or uh, skiing down a slope, I guess. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, really the principles are the same in, in exactly in those three situations you've just described. Yeah, interesting. Okay. And and I can sort of see where and, and probably that does oh well, I'm sure that it applies to those of us who are perhaps not always engaging in what others might seem to be or see as peak performance, but probably are still, you know, we're all required to perform 
in any given moment, even if it's trying to wrestle a toddler. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, you know, I think, you know, I, I think more and more with the pressures of society um, and the expectations and the busyness, you know, there's just so much we're all doing. We, 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 we're almost all in this state and I find that more and more people um, are attracted to that word peak performance and come and see me around that. But really it's, it's managing the stresses that we're all facing, you know, the, the mother trying to work, trying to run a business, trying to, you know, get a healthy meal on the table, trying to do the school pickup. I mean, we're, we're, it's really stuff that we can all relate to. Yeah, so I think it, it applies to all of us and it's the same principles really. Yeah, okay. Well, I will ask you for your tips about handling that sort of stuff a little later on, but I'm interested, who are the people who come to see you in your private practice? Yeah, look, I think it's, 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 yeah, a range of different people. Look, the way I see it, I'm not only dealing with, with peak performance. I mean, my background is in mental health and I've worked a long time in hospitals and, and overseas as well. So I would say still a big percentage of my work is GP referrals around general mental health, general managing stress, relationship issues, addictions, anything like that. The, the sort of the basic work of a psychologist. Um, and I really, I, I, I've always enjoyed that. As I said, that was my, my first passion over the last few years much more around sports and athletes and and peak performance so with with those as I said um there's a number of ways refer you know I see people people you know anyone can come and see me any athlete they might come across me or word of mouth so an athlete coming to see me might be around um there's a problem so there's a problem with with their sporting life, whether it's around performance, whether it's around anxiety management, whether it is generally an issue outside of sport that's affecting their their performance. Um, Other times there's not actually a problem, but they're actually being quite proactive and they do just want to figure out what can I actually do? How can I be proactive? What other tips? techniques can I use to get that little bit better how can I use my get my my mind in the best shape possible otherwise I I also work with the VIS so um, the Victorian Institute of Sport in in Melbourne Um, so there's a couple of sports that I specifically work with and uh, I also work as I said before a lot with cricket and other other particular sports so that way in, in those circumstances the athlete isn't it's not that they haven't got a choice, but it becomes part of what the team is doing and they, they, they're allowed to, they're, they're funded to come and have some sessions with me that way. And, and look, again, the same thing applies. They might just be coming, um, they might have a specific issue that they're working on or wanting to improve on. Um, I find a, a lot of people come, a lot of athletes come about managing those emotions in those high stakes environments. Um, but as I said, the, the other group of people is around um, people that identify as high performance and it may not be related to sport. And, um, I see mu- musicians, um, people in, in sort of high corporate areas and um, entrepreneurs, so people starting their own business and really see that they need some other skills and strategies to um, manage that high demand. And it's encouraging, I think, you know, just as you were listening and talking about that kind of breadth of people, it is encouraging not only that sporting organisations, say, offer that opportunity, but that people are identifying and seeing that psychologists have something to offer that helps us to become really well-rounded um, to, uh, you know, acknowledge that we all have emotions that sometimes make things difficult and that doesn't necessarily mean that we're struggling with a deficit in some area. It's just kind of trying to get a better understanding of, of who we are and how we operate and how we function and and how we can be perhaps more whole or complete, um, both in terms of our performance and what we do, but also just in terms of understanding, you know, this kind of brain and body and how it operates and works together. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really encouraging to see that, that I suppose people are starting to acknowledge that, you know, there's a lot that we can learn about how we function from, you know, psychology as a profession and, and other sil- similar allied professions um, that mm. are going to help them both in terms of their performance, but even just in terms of everyday behaviour. You mentioned managing emotions, managing stress, managing attention. What are the tips that you give to all of your clients, no matter whether they're high performance athletes or entrepreneurs or whether they are day to day clients, 
what are the tips that you give them that help us? You know, what, what could our audience use that would really help us all to perhaps improve our performance or our wellbeing? Yep, absolutely. Look, it's always, again, we start with the basics. I mean, you know, basic sleep, um, hygiene, nutrition, um, exercise. I know you had a great um, podcast on a few weeks ago around the benefits of exercise. And look, I think that's always a good place to start, isn't it, with those, those really essential things at the core of our, at our wellbeing and health. Um, I, I guess, you know, in terms of other ideas, I think I always like the idea of developing insight and awareness um, into our, our psychological profile, our personality, our strengths. Um, so I think, and even understanding emotions, as I said at the start, um, awareness of that, um, the limbic system and, and how all this stuff is connected and the impact that it can have in our day-to-day life, I think. So I like that awareness building aspect. I guess the, the other thing that I think is really helpful for pretty much anyone that I'm working with is, again, awareness around um, the activation of the parasympathetic versus the sympathetic nervous system um, in our highly complex, technologically disruptive society. Um, I think we're, we're just really um, kind of in that sympathetic um, overload of, of cortisol and adrenaline and it's really easy to get sucked up into that and to not look at um, alternatives that are, you know, what else can we be doing other than just being really busy, um, you know, uh, getting everything done and doing it all. What, what are the other things that we can really do to, you know, activate that parasympathetic nervous system, which can really, it's so, such an es- essential part to promoting recovery and rest and um, actually make us perform better. It's just, it really goes against when we're, when we're trying to get more out of ourselves, the human response is just to push ourselves harder. And the hardest thing sometimes is taking that step back and looking at things that are not working harder, working longer. Um, so it's a really difficult concept sometimes for those. Uh, and high performers are often perfectionistic. Um, they have really high standards, expectations. So sometimes getting them to do the opposite of that, like it's easy to say work, like, I, you know, they, they're really happy if I say work harder, work longer. They'll be like, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> and if I say, you know, actually, what do you do for fun and how do you get good, you know, what do you do for like relaxation and what do you do for just unwinding and time out and socialization? That stuff's really hard um, for yeah. them because it's just not, not what that's not their, their zone of comfort because they're yeah. just not used to it. So I getting them to think about those, those um, aspects can be really challenging, but, but so important. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that because I, um, I remember my dad saying that, and, and we tend to be one of those families where everyone's busy and everyone's doing lots of things. Um, and that was kind of how I grew up as well. But I remember my dad distinctly saying, you know, you need to learn how to relax. Mm. It doesn't come naturally for everyone. Particularly to my, to my sister who always does everything at full tilt. <laughs> you know, you actually do, it, it is something that you need to learn to do. And that's kind of stuck with me because I think it is something that as I've got, you know, lots of goals, lots of things I'm trying to achieve, busy, busy, busy. I actually have to consciously say, you know what? I need to stop and do something else, whether it's go for a walk or do, I just picked up my crochet last night for the first time in ages, you know, do, doing activities that are unwinding. Yeah, and, and what people don't understand is how that is connected to their performance. But, you know, in terms of the, the promotion of recovery, I mean, our brain um, is it's not a muscle, but it kind of operates like a muscle. And, and we really, we all understand the concept of recovery for muscles. Like if I've had a heavy day in the gym, I understand that the next day I can't go heavy. And yet, what we're doing in this, in this, you know, in our busy jobs and busy lives is we're running m- mental marathons, but we're not thinking, right, well, I've had a really you know, stressful or heavy couple of days, I actually actively need to let my brain rest and recover from that. We're not, we're not kind of thinking about mm. it, about it in those terms. Mm. So I think that, again, that's really challenging for people who are, you know, in that high-performance mindset, but it's such a vital part. It's so integral to, to getting that better performance, I think. Mm. And Caroline, can you just briefly, because I know you're talking about the the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system and that response, but that might not be language that all of our listeners are aware of. Are you able to just really quickly describe what that means? Yeah, so I guess the sympathetic nervous system, it really just means it's it's a good thing, like it's what we need for, for good operation and for good functioning. 
but um, what's happening is we are getting that release of it. It's connected to the flight or flight response. Um, we are getting that release of cortisol and adrenaline. And adrenaline can be really good in the short term. Um, cortisol tends to build up in the body over time and it can create what's called an allostatic load or wear and tear on the body. So, you know, that's when we might be more vulnerable to illness or even cardiovascular problems. Um, so it can sort of, if it's, if it's too much activation, if we're too much in that space of the busyness and not stopping and not letting go, that is where there can be further implications as well, which, of course, if we're unwell, that's going to impact on performance. But, you know, the activation of the parasympathetic nervous system is really the reversal of that. It's it's producing different, you know, hormones and, and neurotransmitters in the brain that are really beneficial for recovery and promote. It's that rest and digest sort of state yeah. rather than the threat state. Yeah, I don't so know if that explained that. it well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think in my mind, I always think of us as the, the um, sympathetic nervous system or, or response being that kind of stress response, that kind of, you know, everything's pumping harder to get us to keep moving, keep going, keep doing. Um, oh. And the other, and also because I'm a, I practice yoga. So that parasympathetic response of just kind of breathing and calming everything down, calming and slowing Absolutely. the whole system down again. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I think, like I said, I just think that that, I think, I think maybe society, we've generally lost a bit of that ability. I think we're very much outcome driven, goals driven, you know, doing more, fitting more in. I, again, I've, I've kind of reemphasized this point a few times, but I just think um, it's just such an important part of, of what as humans, as we all need to work on. Yeah. Hmm. So what are your tips then for that restorative process for actually slowing everything down what do you advise your clients to do oh it's very you know it's very individualistic what 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 works for one person isn't necessarily going to work for the other so it's gonna you know it's gonna be a right a good fit for them um i think it's variety i think it's um changing things up like doing something outside of the normal routine or habit um being outside in nature is such a restorative aspect going away for weekends perhaps um reading a as simple as reading a book or of, of course it brings up around mindfulness and meditation it also brings up around how much time and energy we we, we have um around our you know uh, paying attention to these thoughts around i must do more i must do more so i guess it comes up a little bit around some of those concepts of from acceptance and commitment training around um or commitment therapy around diffusion sort of letting some of those thoughts go i mean it kind of is a little bit mm. related to that and if we're more able to let those thoughts go not get us caught up in them then we might free us up to go for that walk with a clearer head or take those few deep breaths um you've just mentioned yoga i mean exercise there's so many ways of doing it that and you have i guess you have to find that right fit for for the right person yeah. yeah and the first step being the actual awareness of it in the first yes place. and willing <laughs> to do it and, and understanding why it's important yeah 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 yep. okay and so that I suppose I mean well my understanding is that if we're able to do that and calm everything down then it kind of refuels the body and the mind in order to then step up to the mark for the next we need it yes thing we need yep. to do yeah yeah yep. absolutely yeah okay yep. I guess there's there's other things, you know, in terms of everyday tips about how to get a bit more out of ourselves. Um, I guess keeping things fun and novel and new, even as, as athletes, you know, we, we, we can get very um, cut, caught in the mundane of doing the same thing over and over, but trying to, or as a worker, um, you know, how do we make things a bit more new, interesting, novel, fun, enjoyment? You know, of course, this is going to increase dopamine in the system, which, you know, dopamine is related to the reward system in the brain, which, you know, there's been a lot of correlation with it, with that and performance. So I think that's that's something else to, to think about when working with athlete, um, you know, high performers, athletes, whatever it is. Yeah. 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 I, I've been working with a couple of organizations at the moment about workplace on just workplace environment and how our physical environment affects our creativity and our productivity, but also our sense of well being. And I suppose it is connected to that dopamine and the reward and even just the simple practice of moving around and working in different parts of a physical location. So going, you know, I, I work sometimes from home and I've just started working from a co-working office as well, which is fabulous because I can say, right, today I'm going to go work at the stand-up desk for a little while and then I'm going to go and take my notebook and sit on the comfortable couch 
or today I'm going to go sit by this office window and look out at the view, you know, even just simple things yeah. like that, of just kind of mixing things up to keep. Yes, absolutely. And, and what that's doing is it's also kind of um, increasing, you know, other neurotransmitters in the brain, acetylcholine, you know, that one's really about something surprise and novel. And again, that's related to peak performance and focus. So yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, what else you just tapped into was that um, not just making things different, but, you know, about the social connections, you know, those little conversations and um, meeting new people and all, you know, all, all those kind of relationships and our social connections are so important. Again, all this relates back to peak performance as well. Yeah, it's a different way of thinking about it, isn't it? I think we have been, I suppose, trained in so many ways. And even when we study, you know, I know for those of us who have done psychology, it's a lot of years of slog and study. Um, and there is this mindset that you just keep slogging away at it. You know, you just keep doing it and keep working and, and it's a very single track type focus that I, I guess applies across lots of different professions or lots of different pursuits. But what we're learning is that it's not a particularly helpful strategy for achievement. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) No more just slogging away at it. We've got to think a bit more creatively about how we do these things. Absolutely. And I think the good thing is now we've, we can kind of even break it down to what's happening in the body and what's happening in the brain and show that these things are the things that are going to work and keep us motivated. And, you know, motivation is going to you know, increase in our, our performance and enjoyment and all those things are so highly correlated. Yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating stuff, isn't it? And we're learning so many new things all the time. Caroline, do you have any other kind of resources or things that books perhaps that you found helpful yourself or that you know that your clients have found helpful that might help our audience as well? Oh, look, I, I have a, in my, um, in my consulting rooms, I have a, almost a little library, you know, system going because, um, I read all these wonderful books and, you know, that keeps me, um, obviously informed and I'm just really interested in all those things. And, um, you know, when I'm talking to a client, suddenly I'll say, Oh, you've really got to try read this book. So yeah, look, I, I'm a big fan of, um, talking to clients about other things that they can do that, that they can, um, re- re- research or read up on. I, I have to say my, my number one book that I will always refer people to is Russ Harris, The Happiness Trap. Um, I'm a big fan of Russ. Um, I think he's a he's done a lot of wonderful things in Australia um, in bringing acceptance and commitment therapy to Australia. And yeah, look, I think the book, book's fabulous, and I think it has a lot of great applications. So obviously, it, it ranges from you know people who are struggling with their mental health to people. Um, struggling with other issues in their life or even just wanting to figure out how, how else to navigate, you know, the complexities of life and how to improve that. So I think it has a lot of different applications. Uh, it's a wonderful, easy read for clients and for, for therapists alike. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. I also really love The Happiness Advantage by Sean Acor. Um, I think it's a wonderful book um, and, again, has, has lots of applications. He makes science fun and <laughs> talks about so many interesting um, and engaging, um, you know, he makes research sound really interesting and, and really applicable into the workplace setting. Um Oh, other people, of course, Brene Brown. I think anything by Brene Brown is, even if it's just, a, you know, watching her TED Talk on YouTube, I think um, they're very inspiring. And I'll often, again, get people to watch YouTube videos or short clips um, as a way of not just me sort of talking at people but to, <laughs> you know, to sort of supplement that a little bit. And the last one I would say is um, I really like The Leading Brain. So it's looking at understanding the brain in leadership positions I can't quite pronounce the author's names very well. Friedrike Fabricius and Hans Hagman. Okay. Well, we'll look it up. I will put it in the show notes so that people can find it. And actually sounds a good, like a good one for my library because I don't have it either. So excellent. So that's the leading brain. And I love yeah. your reference there to, to TED Talks that, and, and Sean Acor in particular, his, um, his TED Talk is my absolute favourite of all TED Talks and I show it to groups all the time in workplaces um, for that very reason because not only is he talking about some really important principles around positive psychology and our perception of what success is, so this idea that, you know, we keep thinking that if we work harder we'll eventually be successful and then once we're successful we'll be happy and the fact that that is completely 
backward in terms of what we understand now around success and the fact that really to be successful, if we start with happiness, that's the path to greater success, mm-hmm. whatever, however you define success. Um, mm-hmm. But he is so funny and clever in that TED Talk. Um, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it is my absolute favourite. And, of course, Brené yeah. Brown's TED Talk and, and lots of her other. She's got a great little video on empathy, which I've, you've no mm-hmm. doubt seen. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. actually wonderful. Just touching on on what you said around success, you know, I've, I've, I'm sure you've w- worked with people like this as well, Ellen. Um, people get to that point where they thought they would get to and be happy. So they've reached the pinnacle of success. They've won that gold or silver medal or they've, they've you know, they're, they're highly successful business person and yet nothing changes. Yeah. You know, and that's often the point where, where, so someone might present to see me in that circumstance and it's like, but I thought that this was going to make me happy. Um, <laughs> Yeah. You know, so it's a really interesting concept, isn't it? That that as humans we we are quite conditioned and we are quite driven by that idea of success, but it's not linked with you know necessarily what we think it's linked with. Yeah, you know, inner, inner fulfillment and and real core you know values and well being, and you know it's, it's the two aren't always quite related like that. Yeah, I, I love the line because Sean Acor refers to it as pushing happiness beyond the cognitive horizon. So this idea that, you know, we keep sort of saying that when I get to success, I will be happier, but then our brain just moves the goalposts for success and says, well, you know, now that you've done this, you need to do more. And that's how you'll get. So you never actually get to that point of, of feeling happy. And I could see how that would absolutely apply to people who have set themselves some serious goals in terms of their profession or their sporting pursuit um, and then realise that it hasn't given them that fulfilment that they're expecting. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think it it also ties in a little bit with, um, you know, some, I guess, some schema concepts around unrelenting standards. Like we're so driven by that perfectionism and having to get it uh, right in a particular way that there's never that enjoyment and just sort of savouring the achievements that we have had. And I guess that's another thing it's the, that working with either athletes or in that high-performance space around celebrating the achievements and savouring and recognising them even in the midst of these unrelenting standards so that we can reduce that down a little bit. And, and again, when we're enjoying it more and we're, we're recognising those, those positive steps that we are making, it will boost that performance. Yeah, it helps yeah. to refuel us, doesn't it, actually? Just you know, sitting in that moment of feeling good about what we've done re-energizes and refuels. So yeah, I could see how that would link to performance ultimately. Caroline, I could keep talking to you for ages because there's so many fascinating things there, both in our conversation um, and in all of your work. But um, we both have kids to pick up from school. So, and it's getting to that time of the afternoon. (laughs) I would like to thank you very much for your time and for sharing your experience, both personal and professional, with our audience. I think there's a, a heap in there around thinking of ourselves, no matter what realm we perform in, and we're all performing in something, even if it's just getting you know, through the day, but thinking of ourselves as complete human beings who need to be both challenged but also restored in order to contribute to our well-being and and our continued success in all of our endeavours. So I appreciate all of your input. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. You are very welcome. I will put all of the links to you, your practice at Performance Edge Psychology and your social media links and all of the content that you've shared for us, not only in terms of your tips, but also those resources, the books and TED Talks in our show notes that, that people can find out a little more about you. Thank you very much. That'd be great. No worries at all. Thanks again, Caroline. Thank you, Ellen, for having me. (laughs) Thank you so much for sharing my conversation with Caroline from Performance Edge Psychology about well-being and peak performance. And I apologize for my creaky voice. One of the things that I've learned about performance over the years is that sometimes you just have to push through even when you're not 100% well. But after my discussion with Caroline, I will make sure that I put equal effort into rest and recovery. And I have a couple more new things for the podcast this season. 
Firstly, I want to let you know that the Potential Psychology Podcast is available on Radio Public, which is a free, easy-to-use listening app that also financially supports independent podcasters like me. So I really encourage you, because it'll help me out, to listen to future episodes of the Potential Psychology Podcast via the Radio Public app. And I've put a link to the app in our show notes. Now, in next week's episode of the podcast, I'll be talking to Dr. Deirdre Anderson, who is a performance and transition specialist. And it's a really lovely follow up to today's conversation with Caroline Anderson, no relation, because we'll also be talking about sport and athletes and well-being and performance, but with a particular focus on athletes making the transition to retirement. And Deirdre has worked with some of the world's leading athletes, including Ian Thorpe and Kathy Freeman. And I'm really looking forward to her insights in this conversation. I, I think it's going to be fabulous. So join me then. In the meantime, have a great week and thank you for listening. 